Welcome to the Warbird Mistress for the first part of the production, Luftwaffe at Sea. Now, I know that there's been mixed opinions on me having a video that's half presentation and half me, but I've also gotten plenty of positive remarks on my live videos, so now that I have a day to myself and some quiet, let's see if I can't knock out this first part of what is going to end up being a series. Now, I know that this was a work in progress months and months ago, and by dividing it into parts, I think it's going to be a little easier to digest. It's certainly easier to produce, since time off work and quiet time at home are rare luxuries these days. Uh, that's soon to change, but uh, more on that in time. So for now, we go into this overview of the Luftwaffe's maritime inventory with uh, an introduction piece in the Pentology. In this, I'll be discussing assets from the early 30s and the first years of overt military aviation and their operations in the Spanish Civil War. This will be followed by the build-up in the late 30s in the second episode, Prelude to War. Now, before I begin, I want to first thank my Patreon patrons, YouTube channel members, and those who have bought some of the merch from the store. I know I have to update that for the new artwork, but I'm already sold out. So there are links below at the end if you'd like to support the Warbird Mistress Productions, and you'll also see those in the description below. So let us begin at the beginning, which is a good place to begin, with discussing the role of maritime aviation and the aircraft who first went out over the waters during the birth and growth of the Luftwaffe. Now, maritime aviation in the Luftwaffe, and it was the Luftwaffe, not the Kriegsmarine, as I discussed in previous videos, served the same purposes as maritime aviation in other countries, albeit without carrier aviation truly being a factor. Scouting, spotting, patrol and patrol bombing, mine laying and sweeping, and strike rolls were those with which nearly every nation was concerned in terms of what a capable maritime aviation inventory should be able to offer. Now here I use scouting to refer to armed aircraft in small groups seeking out a known or suspected enemy contact. Uh, spotting regards fire direction and correction for naval artillery against targets at sea or ashore. And patrol and patrol bombing are where a single aircraft, or sometimes a pair or small elements, are sent out to search for any enemy presence in an area or to observe meteorological manifestations as part of an ice or weather patrol. So this includes anti-sub patrols and regular search patrols, both when an enemy is suspected in an area and in the routine course of screening operations. Like scouting, the aircraft is armed to engage the enemy, generally. The difference is that in scout bombers, like the Dauntless or Helldiver, for example, you, they usually take on an attack role once a known or suspected contact is you know, made and defined. While patrol bombers are meant to go into the fog of war where there is no intelligence whatever of the enemy's presence or absence, and then to track the enemy, report movements, and engage when appropriate. So a patrol craft may fill a basic recon role like the Catalinas over the Pacific, where they shadow the enemy as at Midway, or be used as a form of reconnaissance and force and deterrent, such as the Liberators and Sunderlands in the Battle of the Atlantic who could spot, report, and attack a submarine. Now, mine laying can be both offensive and defensive, although where aircraft are concerned, it's generally always in an offensive role, while airborne mine sweeping is always in a defensive role. And lastly, there's strike aircraft. These may be patrol bombers outfitted for a strike against a well-known contact that has been under surveillance, or may refer to hundreds of carrier-based bombers and torpedo aircraft against targets at land or at sea, or refer to land-based bombers attacking maritime targets in general. Now, these five roles are not strictly defined, nor are they formal definitions to be found in universal use. These are simply the five areas into which me, myself, and I have broken down maritime aviation roles so that the place of aircraft at sea may be understood both in the Gestalt and in specific cases in my presentations, thereby reducing potential for misunderstandings in my descriptions of each aircraft's place within the Luftwaffe's inventory. With that, let's quickly go over the types of maritime aircraft. Now, the Luftwaffe made the most use of land-based aircraft, especially as they had no carrier and limited surface assets. The highly active and extremely successful commercial maritime aviation industry of the 20s and 30s helped this. So even without the demand for maritime aviation that was created by overseas territories, like seen in uh, the British Empire, France, the United States, uh, and their industries, Germany boasted an experienced professional maritime aviation sector through the Weimar years. So the four primary types of maritime aircraft in the Reich included 
land-based aircraft with maritime duties like the Focke-Wulf FW-200 Condor, and seaplanes including flying boats and float planes like the Dornier DO-26 and the Heinkel 115. And finally, there were rotary wing aircraft like the uh, Flatner FL-282 Colibri, and it's only one example of an unconventional craft as manned kites and autogyros also fall into the same profile and were designed and produced for use at sea. So land-based scouts and other aircraft were also used, and these were sometimes experimental aircraft or one-off models that were also designed for a maritime role. And those were also included in what's here. It's, it's a long video series, and you know, that's why I'm doing it in bits, but it's definitely going to be comprehensive. So I don't think that even in older episodes of like wings and all that you know we had they did a great episode on uh, the wings at sea with the Luftwaffe but yeah you know, some of the little one-off uh instances they didn't really get into and I, I really want to do that so I could show where the Luftwaffe was where I thought it was going and where it ended up so let's get into it scotchy scotch scotch anyway Apologies to Ron Burgundy. So the first phase to go into is the foundations of maritime aviation in the early years of the Luftwaffe and the use of maritime aircraft in Spain. So the debate over if there was to be a Marina Fliego, a genuine naval aviation branch for the Kriegsmarine, it's the covered in other videos I've done. There's actually two of them, really. Uh, it's sufficient here to say that the benefits of the civil aviation market and overseas front companies that were during the Weimar years, they served well, uh, especially where Dornier and Heinkel were concerned. Uh, I did cover how Dornier kept up with bomber tech in my video on the Weimar Republic's doings in Russia. So you can check out that video. And it's also worth saying that Dornier was a leading designer of flying boats. The Dornier DOX, for example, was the largest flying boat in the world when it was made in 1929. And you know, this 12-inch and parasol monoplane flying boat defined luxury travel and technological advancement. Heinkel, which had only been founded in 1922, was founded in Valnemunde on the Baltic and it benefited from 1920s developments, culminating in 1929 with their own compressed air catapults fixed on the Neudeutsche Lloyd passenger liners SS Bleiman and the SS Europa. These would launch short range. Uh, short-range catapult-launched mail-carrying seaplanes on transatlantic voyages to hasten the delivery of air mail. And these two companies were at the forefront of design at a time where, you know, typically elsewhere you saw much lighter aircraft, um, like the Supermarine Walrus, or you saw dedicated civilian models that went above and beyond, uh, like the beginnings of the Pan Am services. So let's begin with float planes. And with that we have the Heinkel 59. Now, the Heinkel 59 was one design that did not come from a civil background. Ernst Heinkel had first designed the mixed construction biplane for the Reichsmarine in 1930, and it flew under the cover of a civil design in 1931. It would serve long into the war, despite being underpowered with uh, two BMW 6B12s of 660 horsepower each, and it had a top speed of only 137 miles an hour. However, with three defensive guns and a bomb load of up to 1,100 pounds, or a single 1,764-pound torpedo, she was definitely a threat at sea. She served in Spain against Soviet freighters in the Mediterranean theater. Uh, one was shot down in Spain in what was likely the only victory by a Grumman FF, or any Grumman biplane for that matter. Uh, it was made under license by the Canadian Car and Foundry Company and was known as the GE-23 Delphine. As part of the Aufklärungsstaffel Z 88, it flied out of uh, Cadiz in the autumn of 1936 and then to Malaga in February 1937. And eventually in Majorca, the HE-59 flew reconnaissance while the U-52 and HE-59 also flew bombing and torpedo attacks when vessels of the observer forces were never present. Technically, Germany was blockading Spain along with France and Britain, and the goal was to keep Soviet weapons out. In reality, the latter two supported the nationalists passively, while the Germans used the Unterseebootwaffe and seaplane bombers against Soviet ships. Now, in January 1938, Hauptmann Martin Hallenhausen took over the Staffel and operated against the port cities of Alicante, Almeria, Barcelona, and Cartagena in Catalonia, uh, where that was basically the where the Soviet-controlled communists held out the longest. Um, 
The change to bombing was mostly due to the ineffectual Norwegian Whitehead torpedoes that were being used. Although 10 ships were attacked, none of the torpedoes worked, and aerial bombs and strafing attacks ended up being used instead. This was a notorious problem in that era. And with Soviet supply ships becoming less frequent and eventually nothing, the HE-59 grew to be used against inland targets as Franco's forces fought towards victory and the Russians started to pull out. So with that, we moved into, uh, as I just mentioned, the HE-60, uh, at least I thought I did. Uh, it was another twin float Heinkel aircraft that was used along with the U-52. With no bomb load, she was a two-seater scout with a single rear gun for defense and a top speed of 150 miles an hour. She had a range of 513 miles, which gave her about three and a half hours in the air. Uh, like the HE-59, this was a Heinhold Mavis design, and this kind of shows in her general outfit. He he, uh, he had a, a design that kind of showed who he was, and it's funny how so many designers have that. And You know, uh, Reinhold Mavis was really no different. Now, for a basic float plane, she served her purpose as she was suited for service on the open seas. Uh, they made 361, and they were very sturdy, but they were sturdy to a fault. Uh, she was also slow and unmaneuverable. So she found herself withdrawn from frontline service by 1940 and re-entered service as a coastal patrol craft in the Baltic and the Black Sea just because she could put up with some of the weather there. Uh, but really, except for that, there, she was a sitting duck and any aircraft really, even no matter how outdated, would have found her an easy kill. So those are the float planes. Now, moving into flying boats, we definitely start with a very famous example, and that's the Donia Jut, which was called the Val, or Whale. And she served from 1923 to 1950 in the civilian market, and was a development of Claudius Dornier's RS Fia of 1918, also known as the uh, Zeppelin Lindau RS Fia. And she had unique sponsons and brace parasol construction of stressed skin, but she had better engines. Um, she was already in service abroad with military and civilian liner roles. The DO-16 was the RLM designation for the Ut-2, with a pair of BAM V6 water-cooled V-12s in the nacelle above the wing in the push-pull arrangement. A top speed of 115 miles an hour and a cruising speed of 90 miles an hour over a range of 500 miles, she was limited. She could not perform um, like the United States' consolidated PY which was the military's version of the 1928 Commodore flying boat uh, by Pan American's uh, design needs. But she was outperformed by even military-specific designs of the late 1920s, such as the uh, 1929 Consolidated P2Y, which was the predecessor to the PBY Catalina. And she was never really supposed to be at that level. So to understand scale, the Commodore had 32 passengers and three crewmen, while the Vol had 8 to 10 passengers in her civil arrangement. She was a record setter in her own right, though, and she deserves to be famous. She held the record for the northernmost point flown in Amundsen's failed 25 expedition, where a vol also flew out the surviving crew after they'd already been presumed dead. The uh, vol made the first nighttime crossing of the Atlantic. And this was when uh, Portuguese aviator uh, Major Sarmento de Beres flew from Vizagos to uh, Fernando de Noronha in Brazil. Uh, the northern air route across the Atlantic which was from Silt to Iceland, uh, then Greenland, Labrador, and New York, was made by a Val in 1930. And in 1939, they were uh, used by the third German Antarctic expedition as well. So she was definitely a plane that could survive in extremes and it also made for comfortable and convenient passenger use. So as an airliner, the Val made South Atlantic voyages to and from Brazil, the Gambia, uh, and Germany or Britain, and they were also flown uh, by many civilian lines in many nations who m picked up either a small number of them or just made you know, one and made, made their business with that. She was rugged, she was sturdy, she was easy to repair, and she was affordable. Now, transatlantic mail voyages were also flown by using catapult-equipped tenders uh, stationed for refueling, and these were operated by Lufthansa, um, and they would serve until 1937. So the military variant, unlike the civilian one shown here, had two or four crewmen all in the open nose cockpit and a single defensive gun in the nose. So Spain, Germany, the Argentine, Chile, the Netherlands, uh, Yugoslavia, the USSR, Italy, Norway, Portugal, Colombia, and Uruguay all used the Val in a military role. 
although its service within the Wehrmacht was really limited by the arrival of the successor, the 18th. So while much more advanced, the DO-18 development of the VA shared the basic layout, but not much else. The sponsons, a push-pull motor arrangement, and a similar hull shape were all retained, albeit significantly streamlined with a better aerodynamic and hydrodynamic qualities. So they're kind of part of the, the Dornier progression, and you see its heritage there, but that's where it stops. The motors, interestingly, were no longer the V-12 petrol engines. Instead, they had two 600-horsepower Junkers Jumo 205 C4 six-cylinder diesels. And this is a unique choice for an aircraft motor, especially one meant for service on salt water. Dornier had chosen these heavier, bulkier motors as they had greater power and fuel efficiency. In a time when fuel was expensive and ocean tra travel by aircraft was very popular. So civilian and military versions of this 1935 aircraft totaled 170 examples, although only six ended up being used by Lufthansa. So one of these, which was named Zyklon, or Cyclone, had a much larger wingspan, and this permitted it to cruise on a single engine, allowing it to fly the South Atlantic commercial route from September of 37 to March of 39. And it made the trip about once a week on average. When war broke out, 62 of the DO-18s were still in Luftwaffe service, and they were the only flying boats available at the time. So they served in five maritime recon units over the North Sea, and the final squadron was still flying the 18 as late as May 1941. These cruised at an efficient 120 miles per hour for an incredible range of 2,200 miles and could reach a maximum speed of 160 miles an hour. So one way you're looking at a 4,000 mile ferry range. Uh, she was weakly armed, however, and her ordnance capability was limited. And it either carried 210 pound or 220 pound bombs under the starboard wing hardpoints and defensive armament was just a single uh, MG-15 7.92mm machine gun in the dorsal and nose positions, and that was not enough. Uh, when 26th of September 1939, a DO-18 of the Zweite Kristenfieger Gruppe 506, which was piloted by uh, Lieutenant Sosse Ernst Körner, became the first German aircraft uh, downed by Lieutenant B.S. McEwen and his gunner, Acting Petty Officer B.M. Seymour, off of the Great Fisher Bank. So the crew were rescued by the, uh, it was a tribal class destroyer, HMS Somali, and the aircraft KX uh, cross YK was sunk by the ship's gunners. So interestingly enough, the design was sturdy that she actually had to be sunk after she crashed uh, on sea. But less sturdy or so were the land-based patrol aircraft at the time, and that first and foremost was going to be the Tante Yu. Uh, she was one of the aircraft that was in maritime service, both civilly and militarily. Probably one of the world's most famous airliners. She also was a bomber, a cargo aircraft, uh, troop and paratrooper transport, executive transport, and all around, you know, tin can extraordinaire. The Junkers trimotor had been fitted with floats in the civilian world and found itself once more going feet wet in the Spanish Civil War. The first time it was outfitted with floats to serve as a bomber was not in Germany, however, it was actually in Colombia. And this was during their brief war with Peru, uh, 1932. And so the Luftwaffe ended up ordering the conversion of U-52s into bombers while awaiting the completion of Dornier's DO-11. The DO-11 ended up being a craft of dubious value. So the 52 ended up staying in the bomber role through the late 30s. And the... Uh, the last U-52s actually were used in the assault on Warsaw. That was the last time it was used as a bomber. So she was outfitted with two bomb bays with up to 3,300 pounds of bombs, uh, was defended by a 7.62 millimeter MG-15 in the dorsal and ventral dustbin positions. In Spain, she served excellently as a transport, and she facilitated the nationalist forces move from Spanish Morocco to the mainland. At sea, she was used in bombing of ports and inland targets as well as for reconnaissance and patrol purposes. She served during the war at sea as a military transport and a float plane, and especially as a minesweeper, which is a role that we'll discuss a might later. One thing in this video that I'm going to do is that if there are multiple variations of one aircraft, you'll see that I 
kind of wait and hold off until it's the right time to discuss when it entered into a specific role. So let's go back now. I kind of mentioned right now the DO-11's uh, short bus status, but there is a gosling among the ducks in Dornier's early 30 developments, and that was the 13. It was another, but had grown merely to become another very ugly duck. The DO-23 was yet another in the nest, and no beautiful swan was found, merely a goose with some cognitive difficulties. Developed from bombers and tests in the Soviet Union, a topic on which, I, like I mentioned, I did that video, uh, she entered service in 1934 with a top speed of 160 miles an hour, but a cruising speed of merely 130 miles per hour, so it wasn't the most efficient cruising aircraft there. She had three defensive guns and a 2,200-pound bomb load. The contemporary Hanley Page Hayford was 20 miles an hour slower, but it was otherwise a fitting comparison, so thinking about that puts to rest the idea that Germany was always at the forefront of technology, since neither aircraft was at the forefront of technology. Still, the 23 left service within two years of active service as the DO-17 was introduced in 1936. However, the DO-23 was used as a minesweeper early in the war before leaving service. And she wasn't even used as a trainer. She was instead uh, turned into an experimental agricultural aircraft, of all things. So the airframe was a good one, and the DO-17 and the proposed four-motor DO-19 were close relations. She was sturdy enough even to mount large magnetic rings necessary for mine-sweeping duties. And, you know, as you can see, they're bulky, they're heavy, and they require an airframe that is going to be stable enough. It's not going to snap the wings off it. So she definitely found some use as awkward as she was in every other possible way. And on that note, we conclude the introduction and the early years of the Luftwaffe at sea. I hope that this presentation laid the foundations well enough that we can then move on to prelude to war, opening moves, holding patterns, and denouement. So prelude to war includes many of the most famous seabirds of the Reich. Opening moves includes an in-depth examination of how the Luftwaffe trained men for service at sea, how maritime units were deployed, and some of their greatest battles during the war. That's a really in-depth video. Um, so holding patterns, which is the installment thereafter, describes maritime adventures as the war turned tides against Germany and her allies. While, together with the final installment, Denouement, maritime aviation started to show some truly advanced designs come to light. And uh, it's just, as timing, you know, I think one thing famous about Germany is all of her great ideas came last. So, of course, I hope you tune in for that next episode. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you for all your commentary, your shares, likes, and all that. I'm very thankful to those who support the channel on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. They begin at $3 and $1 per month, respectively. And until next time, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care. <laughs>